Welcome, everyone. So speaking, I am Gabrielle Oates from Innovate EDU, representing the Educating All Learners Alliance. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over um, some things that you'll notice here. So uh, as you can see, you will all be muted throughout today's webinar. And that is just to ensure that our presenters will be able to unmute themselves and be able to share. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please add those to the chat. We highly encourage you to do so. And hopefully, we'll have time at the end to answer those. Uh, we will be recording today's webinar, as you may have seen, and posting it on ELO's YouTube page afterwards for you to share. And we also wanted to share uh, that you will be able to hide non-video participants if that aids you in focusing on the interpreter or the presenters. And you can do that in your Zoom settings. Um, and so if you have any technical issues, for example, with audio, I encourage you to go to the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen and click switch to phone audio. And that usually helps people reconnect. But for today, I wanted to welcome you to our webinar on deaf learners and designing practice to support their learner variability using a whole child framework. In terms of the ELA community, it was created in response to the COVID-19 crisis and is a collection of resources and information for students, teachers, and families to use, particularly during this remote learning time. We have a few of our founding partners here some of which are joining us as presenters on today's webinar, as well as a growing list of over 50 partner organizations. And for today's speaker, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Barbara. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Pape. I work at Digital Promises Learner Variability Project, and we are honored to be part of ELA's Uncommon Alliance and thrilled to bring to you this webinar. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to give a shout out to our Director of Research and a New America Learning Sciences Exchange Fellow, uh, Meida Tara, who diligently provides the backbone of research for our Learning Variability <laughs> Project uh, web app and work with Sarah Beth Sullivan on our hearing factor. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Maida. And now for today's speakers. We have Dr. Melissa Herzig, and Melissa is the Director of the Translation in the Science of Learning Lab and Assistant Director for PhD in Educational Neuroscience Program at Gallaudet University. Next, we have Wendy Brem, and Wendy works cross-functionally at the National Center for Special Education for Charter Schools to support a wide range of projects. Uh, and then we have Sarah Beth Sullivan. Sarah Beth is a third year doctoral candidate in educational neuroscience at Gallaudet University. Currently, she is also a research intern with us here at Digital Promises Learner Variability, Learner Variability Project. And uh, we have been quite impressed with her knowledge, her work and her passion. So I will turn it over uh, to our wonderful speakers. Thank you. Hello everyone. I will be signing for today's webinar and I have an interpreter speaking for me. Again, thank you for inviting me to the panel. I'm very proud of our student, Sarah Beth Sullivan. She's done a great job as an intern at Digital Promise and it's a great partnership with ELA. I'll start off by talking about deaf students and their backgrounds. Deaf students are not simply students who can't hear and need accommodations. There's so much more variability in deaf students' background in terms of their upbringing, their school, 
their environment, and their own experiences. And so that's something that we'll talk about today. And these are a few of the myths that I'll be talking about during the panel. One is that all deaf children have similar backgrounds. And then we'll talk about the second two myths in later slides. So who are deaf and hard of hearing students? Some deaf students are born deaf. They're what we call prelingually deaf, meaning that they garnish all information from their eyes since birth. Some deaf people have a language foundation in English. They can hear well and then become deaf later in life. That could be at three years old or later at six or seven. Some deaf students can hear a little bit, maybe out of one ear, or they can hear um, minimally bilaterally, um, but sometimes that is enough to miss a lot of content, even though they do have a lot of hearing. Some students use adaptive listening devices, whether hearing aids or cochlear implants, and need different types of supports based on those listening devices. Some hear more than others. Also, the language experience for deaf students is different. Some students start with an oral approach, speaking and listening. And then once that doesn't work, later in third or fourth grade, maybe, they will transition to learning sign language. Some students are used speaking and listening until even middle school or older than that. Other students are born signing, meaning that their parents have either learned sign language than when they found out they had a deaf child or their parents already signed and they had access to American Sign Language from birth. Other students may be deaf blind and use protactile sign language in order to communicate. Protactile meaning a hand cell provided in the hands. Some students may be bilingual, knowing English and ASL, some trilingual, maybe their parents speak Spanish at home. And again, deaf students may know two, three languages or even more. Some may have limited access to language and they may have str struggled listening and speaking growing up and then transition to learning sign language later in life. Or, a, or didn't have much access during their critical period to language, which is what we call language deprivation, which has a huge impact on the child's language, especially during that critical period. They also have different educational backgrounds. They may have been educated in a public school setting uh, or in a deaf school setting. Some students are the only deaf person in their entire school or they may have self-contained classrooms where they have deaf peers. They may also have gone to an oral school for the deaf where they do have deaf peers, but their language modality is speaking and listening. Or they may have gone to a deaf school where everyone signed. And so again, that has a huge impact on a deaf child's language experience, their education, their learning, their social emotional skills as well as their ability to attend information, whether that be uh, their literacy, whether that be attending to the interpreter and the speaker. Again, all of these things can have a huge impact on the deaf child. And we also can't overlook their intersectional identities. This may affect how they connect to the content in schools. Again, their background and their experience may be a different culture. They may have a different sexual orientation. And so again, these are all part of a deaf child's intersectional identity, which can influence their social emotional development as well as their academic learning in the school environment. So we need to shift our perspective of a deaf child who is a child with hearing loss. A deaf child is much more complex than that. They're a language learner. And that child needs to have enough language access early in life. And if they do not, that can influence their experience. As well as how much the support they may need. This is also influenced by educators' expectations. 
A student may come in behind in language and then the educator has lower expectations of that child, not expecting them to be able, able to access the content or watering down the content. You as educators have a huge role and control over the, what the student will learn in your classroom, how they will learn it, and how they will be able to meet your expectations. I am a former high school teacher and I remember that at the beginning of the year, with the freshmen would come in and I would always ask them, you know, a question. For example, if I asked them a question that they needed to answer why or what, many of the students didn't even try to answer the question. You know, I would ask them, what do you think? And then would wait for me to give them the answer because they had experienced teachers who before would just fill in the gaps that they didn't have. And so I remember that experience. And so it's so important for us as educators to not assume that children can't think critically because that can influence their motivation and their ability to rise to the challenge. And I love this quote from Tom Humphreys. Let's shift our perspective toward deaf and hard of hearing individuals from disabled students to language learners. And just make sure that they have a variety of ways to access the curriculum and the, the materials, whether they are using written English, spoken English, or sign language. It's also important to be mindful of how we write IEP goals. I've seen this many times and it's one of my pet peeves. Often people will write, because this person is deaf, they are behind in reading and we need to set these goals for that particular student. And it's not because that student is deaf, it will be because of the language access they've had and the teacher's expectations. And again, if those things are in place, if we make appropriate accommodations for the students, they will learn. So again, it's important to be mindful of what we write in the IEP. It's not because a person is deaf, but it might be because that they have had limited access to the curriculum or limited language exposure and not getting the accommodations they need. Let's now shift to the next myth. Again, we've talked about the myth that deaf children have similar backgrounds. The second is deaf students should learn only one language. Let's look at some of the beliefs that are out there. One is that deaf students should only learn one language. Whether that be signed or spoken, they should focus on one language at a time to build the foundation in the first language before introducing a second. The second is that it's best to focus on this foundation or especially oral language before focusing on sign language or focus on sign language only and hold back written English. Another belief is that exposing two languages or more will confuse the child. All of these are false. Through the Science of Learning Center Visual Learning Visual Language, we have years and years of research, over 40 years of research that show that you can introduce two to three languages to a child and the earlier the better. This will not confuse the child. They are adapted biologically to be able to understand and parse out the different languages and they will be able to distinguish between those languages. There are also many benefits of being multilingual. Just like there are benefits to children who speak more than one language, there are benefits to children who know multiple languages and multiple modalities. Sign languages benefit the brain, help the brain process information faster, and help children see things from different perspectives. Children can have better word recognition. 
better self-expression because they have the ability to navigate between these languages. So those who are bilingual actually do better in reading and writing. And when we looked at Petito's brain lab and the research that came out of BL2, we found that there is a huge bilingual advantage for those who know two languages over one. This especially benefits readers. They read earlier and have you know, critical strategies of how to be able to read and read quicker. And so again, withholding one language and waiting till a child has a foundation in the other first doesn't work. It's important to introduce English and sign language early in a child's life. There are many people who believe that providing sign language for a child will affect their literacy skills and their ability to acquire spoken English. But what we know is that the exact opposite happens, that children who are provided with sign language learn to speak better and do better in school. If we hold back a language, the chance of language deprivation uh, and missing out gives the child a disadvantage especially if they're not acquiring that language well, and it goes past the critical period, it gets harder and harder for a child to learn their second language or become proficient in a second language. And so don't wait, start exposing the child to as many language opportunities as possible so that they can do well and pick up those languages in the critical period. The next myth is that hearing aids and cochlear implants solve accessibility issues. Children are having access to cochlear implants earlier and earlier these days. So let's talk about some of the beliefs that are out there about assistive listening devices. We find that many people believe that children who have hearing aids and cochlear implants can understand everything that's going on in their environment. Often people believe that if a child is inattentive, it means they're being lazy and not trying hard enough or not being focused. Often people believe that with cochlear implants and hearing aids, we can focus on speech only and not provide sign language. And people believe that if a child then needs it later, they can be exposed to sign language later. Also, because they can hear, this means that they should be able to participate in discussions, in presentations, and read alouds. Uh, and often, teachers believe that they don't need to provide additional accommodations to students. Again, all of these are false. A child's ability to do well with an assistive listening device depends on their own background. If a child loses their hearing later in life and already has a background in spoken English, they might do better with a cochlear implant or hearing aid once they've been trained to use that device. And most of those students might do okay because they already had access to language from birth. What we know is that students who already have access to language, whether that be spoken language or a sign language from birth and then get a cochlear implant those students who already know words and then transition to a spoken language already have a basic understanding of how language works. And so most of those students do better if they're provided with sign language before getting a cochlear implant. Especially students who know several languages can be able to connect to those languages to understand meaning and content. 
There are also many other factors that affect a child's success using an assistive listening device. And often we don't realize that there are so many things in the environment that can disrupt a student's listening and disrupt their ability to hear and understand what's going on. For example, things like fans and air conditioners can interrupt the listening experience of deaf students who are using these devices. It's much harder for them to filter out noise. That is true of he both hearing aids and cochlear implants, especially if a conversation is going quickly between multiple participants, it may be hard for them to follow. So mm, a lot of background noise can affect a deaf child's ability to access the content. They might be able to hear the content, but they might not be comfortable speaking. Or a child may be comfortable speaking, but it's hard for them to understand others. Research also shows that 30 to 40% of those with a cochlear implant still need additional accommodations. Especially things like having a teacher of the deaf do some pre-teaching or post-teaching of the content. 30 to 40% of people say that CIs feel, or 47 to 50% say that they feel like they did not benefit from a cochlear implant or hearing aid. And so that's not always the answer. It's important for us to think about that when we are giving accommodations to students and make sure that the classroom is fully accessible to them. Students benefit from more access than less. Often, the more access that you give to a deaf child, the more access everybody has in the entire classroom. Universally designed instruction helps all students, especially students who have English as a second language, or students who come from other countries and are newly acquiring English. Again, all of these accommodations for a deaf child also accommodates everyone else. Now we know that students have different learning styles. Some prefer listening to lectures, other prefer, others prefer to read and write. And so again, what you're doing for a deaf child benefits all children in your classroom. So again, how do you support a deaf child when deaf children come from a variety of different backgrounds and experiences? We have FAQs that are posted on VL2's website. You can look at our family organization. We have a lot more information that's posted there. And I recommend that all of you look at that website in order to see the several research briefs that we have on various topics. There's a link on this slide. And after the webinar is finished, you will receive access to the slides. Sarah Beth will be sending that out with the links. And so feel free to explore on your own after this webinar. Again, Barbara will send that out. And Sarah Beth and Wendy both have a lot more ideas and strategies to share with you about how you can accommodate students that are in the classroom, especially during these times of distance learning where students may be at home, accessing their classroom from a laptop. Both Sarah Beth and Wendy will talk through how to use those strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Herzig for giving us such valuable information. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentation. As we've discussed, the classroom has a very variety of different learners. Learning science research provides support and how to best support and engage the diversity of learners that we have in the classroom. Also, the Learning, Learner Variability Project team works at all of the intersections of research, with educators, researchers, and ed tech developers, so that we can develop a more rich and equitable education experience for all learners.
We also know that there is no one profile or set of profiles for learners. Each student can vary on a number of factors that have shown, been shown to impact learning. So here you can see how two students can remain generally similar, but still have unique areas of varying skills and needs. So for example, the student on the left with strategies to support decoding skills, also for long-term memory. They need both types of support in the lesson plan. But if you provide those supports that can support both the student on the right and the left, and even all students in the classroom. Here at the Learner Variability Project, we recognize that learning sciences research provides insights into how best to engage our full diversity of learners. Consequently, we translate this ever-growing research into easily accessible factors and strategies that can inform both product design and classroom practice. So the research-based factors and strategies together compromise our learner models. And these models are free, open source, and based on a whole child framework. I will now switch over to speaking because I'm going to show the learner models to all of you. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to utilize the Learner Variability Navigator or the Learner Variability Projects Navigator and the Learning Needs Explorer that teachers can use to benefit their planning. By clicking on this link, it will bring you to the Learner Variability Projects homepage and I'm going to share my screen so that, um, so that you can view that. And so here you will see that this homepage, you can see on the top bar here, we have six different models and we have three for math, one for reading and two for literacy. Now we wanted to give you a real world example of how you could use a navigator for a deaf student. So our other presenter, Wendy, generously shared some of her experiences to demonstrate on this webinar. To give you a little bit of background about Wendy, she is hard of hearing, she has two hearing parents and a younger brother who is deaf and autistic. Her first language was English, but she started learning ASL at the age of three. She attended a deaf school in her primary school years and was mainstreamed in a public high school before attending the University of Baltimore for her bachelor's and American University for her master's. So here on this homepage, you have the option to take a video tour of the site as well as see the models here, and you can look at our learning explorers here and learn more about LVP here. So today we're going to apply some of Wendy's experiences in the public school system to the literacy four to six model. So here you'll see that each model has three different themes that comprise the different um, skills and concepts that students should be acquiring in these grades. If you follow the factor tab, you will see a list of factors that are encompassed in four categories, student backgrounds, social and emotional learning, cognition, and literacy. If you hover over a strategy or a, a factor, you'll see what other factors they're related to. Each factor has a research-based connection with these factors that are lit up in their respective colors. And that just demonstrates that there's research that shows that those two things are related. So for instance, if we click on hearing, we can go down here and on the right, you can see a breakdown of how here at LVP, we define hearing loss and auditory processing disorder and a little bit more information about hearing. And on the left, you can explore a little bit more about our factor connections. For instance, if you go, if you hover over one of them, you can see a small blurb about how that can be related to hearing. Or you can go over to writing skills. 
Um, and you can just see a brief statement about how those are related. And below, you can see research-based strategies specifically for that factor. And I'm going to review the strategies right here on the strategy tab. So here you can see that there is a number of strategies that are supporting the literacy four to six network or literacy four to six model. And so you'll see these bars here under each of the strategy titles and those just demonstrate the different factors that those are related to. And if you want to highlight one specific factor, you can see what strategies have been um, labeled as specifically supporting that factor. Now, we want to explore how teachers could better understand how to design supports for Wendy. So we're going to go to the Explorer here and select the Learning Needs Explorer. And you're going to come to this um, interface here where you can select a content area. So we're going to select literacy four to sixth grade and you're gonna input your email. And then here you can select a variety of factors that are going to represent your student. So Wendy is hard of hearing, so we're going to select the hearing tab. Wendy also knows ASL and is fluent in ASL, so we're going to also select primary language. We're also going to select social supports because as a deaf student among many hearing peers, Wendy often struggled to communicate with her hearing peers and did not feel like she had a strong social support system. Now over in cognition, we're going to pick speed of processing. We're picking speed of processing because Wendy also had an interpreter in school and sometimes took longer to process classroom content because she had to divide her attention between the teacher, the board, the interpreter and her notes. We're also going to select for the last one, vocabulary, because Wendy struggled to learn new vocabulary words due to the fast paced nature of classes with little visual support for definitions. So now that we've picked a few, we're going to click next. And you can see here that it's offering a few other factors that we could select that the Explorer has determined might be related to some of the factors that we've already selected. So since we have a good amount here, I'm going to go ahead and click next. And then you'll see a whole bunch of strategies that support either all or some of your factors. We can see here that collaborative writing supports every single one of the factors that we've selected. So we're going to add that to a workspace which I will explain in just a little bit. But collaborative writing would really help with Wendy's social supports because it provides structured ways for her to interact with her peers, as well as improve her vocabulary and um, have access to her interpreter while she's working with classmates. Now, as we go down, we can select a few more that pique our interest. And for instance, I think that graphic organizers would be a really wonderful way to help her speed of processing um, learning needs because that provides a good way to keep information structured, to build on prior knowledge, and to incorporate new information. So we're going to add that here. I also think that Gallery Walk might be really wonderful because it provides a little bit of a looser structure to interact with her classmates and also engage in the physical nature of the learning supports and make and use hands-on activities. And then we'll keep looking and multimodal instruction seems to cover a lot of our factors. And so we'll include that because multimodal instruction is extremely important to provide varied content, varied methods of providing the content so that students can absorb the information in the best way for them. So now that we've selected a few, I'm going to go ahead and create a workspace. So here we can name this Wendy's Supports. And now you see everything is kind of in one area here. Now, if we want to 
separate this and organize this a little bit, we can create a new section where we add all of the strategies into one section and we can name this Wendy's strategies and we can name this Wendy's factors. And so here, you can also add notes, which I think is a really awesome support because I think that you could add in some more information about how this factor influences Wendy and how that might support her learning. So Wendy seems to need support in meaningful interactions with her peers. And so you can save those notes and go back to them later and see why you thought that that factor was important. And you can also create further sections like more um, interactive strategies. So this is interactive strategies. And so you can divide this up into however many ways you please. And you can also add workspace notes to help organize your thoughts. And so those will always be visible to you as an educator. And you can also have multiple. And I'm gonna show you one other workspace that we have developed that supports teachers in organizing their um, lesson plans. So this one is titled Supports for Learners with Disabilities in a Distance Learning Context, which is might be really helpful for all of you. So if you guys want, we're happy to share this workspace with you. So here you, you have clickable links where you can click curated list of special education resources and we have different categories of supports like attention and memory supports and they're also you can see divided by their models so graphic organizer was specifically found to support the literacy four to six model whereas movement breaks was found to be more supportive for the math three to six model so as we go down here, we can see that we have some of these awesome supports and they're tailored to math, writing, etc. So this is a really awesome way to organize your, um, your supports for each individual student, but it's also a space where you can design supports for the whole classroom. Now I'm going to um, stop sharing and switch that back over to Gabrielle and we can go over our other slides. One concern you may have is accessibility. For example, do students have access to supports, be they auditory or visual, things like captioning access to videos? You know, whether that be you know, captions that have been professionally created or the YouTube auto captions, which may or may not be correct. The second is socialization with peers. This is so important for a child's development. But again, often there are limited opportunities for meaningful interactions with peers during distance learning. And that can be a big concern, especially for deaf students. Another is parental support. The student's parents may work. They might also not be knowledgeable about the content areas, or they may be busy with other siblings. The parents you know, may not, or the students may not have enough parental support. Another is digital literacy. Teachers may rely more heavily on text or independent work and students may need additional support, especially more support with reading or detailed aspects of reading. Also home environment. We never truly know a student's home situation. We don't know if they have siblings, how many computers they have access to, and what kind of supports they have in learning. If they're not in a quiet, clean, and well-lit area, ready to attend class and have that opportunity to socialize with their peers. The final thing that's so important is access to technology. Do they have good Wi-Fi? Do they have access to Wi-Fi at all times? And how many computers do they have at home? 
Do those are those computers equipped with webcams? So there are so many issues with technology that you may not be aware of when the students are at home. And so it's important to keep that in mind when designing your lesson plan, especially for distance learning. Things to keep in mind for distance learning. One is that you want to make sure that interaction, feedback, and multimodal instruction are all crucial to successful learning. How to make your lessons interactive, fun, and engaging for all learners, while still making sure that all necessary supports are present. Also, make sure that you invite feedback from your students and make sure that you can adjust future lesson plans and make sure that you're accommodating students' needs. Visual demands should also be minimized. Deaf students often have to multitask with several demands, which are higher for deaf students, as they must to attend to the interpreters or use the assistive listening devices, in addition to that same visual information hearing students are presented with. Also, while hearing students can attend to multiple pieces of information at the same time, a deaf student can only attend to visual information one at a time. And so it's important to not present those, that information simultaneously. So for example, if you present a graphic on the screen, give a child a minute to look at that graphic before engaging in discussion. Also, there may be lags in internet connection. So it's important to make sure that the lessons are always recorded and available for students once that lesson is finished so that the student can go back and rewatch that. The interpreter may have been hard to see, especially if they didn't have quality Wi-Fi at the time. So it's important to record that information so the student can refer back to that lesson. When you're designing support for videos, as well as online content, make sure, especially for videos that are provided uh, over video captions are preferable. But when you have a long video, make sure that you also have a full transcript that is available so that students can read the content after. Often students will have a hard time attending to both the visual content that is presented as well as the captions and may not be able to remember all of the content. So it's important to have a transcript available after the student watches the video. I want to thank the National Deaf Center for so many valuable resources that we've included on this webinar. And now we'll turn it over to Wendy Brown. We have some wonderful resources to share with you. Again, I wanted to thank Digital Promise for the Learner Variability Project. And again, I wish that my teachers had had access to that to be able to support my needs during my years as a student. So I want to focus on teacher resources for distance learning. The first two resources are by the National Deaf Center on Post-Secondary Outcomes. Especially during this, this pandemic, it's so important that we focus on communication access. Also, the second is a resource of how educators and schools can be proactive. There's a blog for families and parents and how to support students during this time, which is so important to teachers who are teaching deaf and hard of hearing students. And the last two resources uh, for the, in this slide talks about equity for deaf students. Also, in terms of how to support students during this pandemic, these are great online resources for both teachers and schools to make sure that the information is both equitable and accessible to students, especially on distance learning platforms. So there are resources for signing deaf students. 
Again, there's an FAQ for teachers and educators on how to best support these students. Also, a great remote learning page that talks about supporting students in K through 12 and college environments. The learner variability navigator that Sarah Beth just showed us will help students, whether they are in a signing or a spoken English environment. And also, as Melissa showed us, a VL2 that has family information as well as information for teachers. It talks about bilingual access for families who have deaf and hard of hearing children. SL Clear is also a fantastic resource for signing deaf students to make sure that there are, that are accessible and accurate signs for STEM concepts. Next slide, please. The next slide is resources for oral deaf students. The Montclair National Deaf Education Center has information that focuses on oral-based communication and assistive technology. There's another page that focuses on an educational plan for students with cochlear implants to understand how they can design supports because not all deaf students with hearing aids or cochlear implants are created equal. Many like myself have learned sign language as well as learning spoken English. And so not all rely on a spoken English as their communication modality. Also the learner variability navigator Again, for students like myself, many teachers that I had didn't know how to accommodate my needs. And so the Learner Variability Navigator helps with that. And then the last piece is tips written by deaf students for teachers. And again, I love this one because these are things that I wish my teachers knew. This is written by deaf students who have this experience on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's a great resource. Next slide, please. There are a lot of resources that focus on Black, Indigenous, people of color. It's important to provide cultural content in the classroom and to be able to bridge the gap between cultural differences between the teacher and the student, to have inclusive deaf education, to make sure we think about including equity and cultural experiences in your lesson plan. And how can we make sure that students are included regardless of their background? There are several statistics out there. For example, 40.6% of black deaf people are unemployed. Also many of them have experienced bullying and discrimination in the classroom. And the intersectional impact of gender, race, and disability results in underemployment and lower earning, particularly for Black deaf women and deaf people with additional disabilities. So it's worth our work to make sure that our classrooms are accessible and equitable, and always taking, keeping in mind intersectional differences. Not just how a student accesses information, but considering their entire intersectional identity. So that's all I have for now. Again, I wanted to thank everyone for sharing these resources with you. This is a great opportunity. I wanted to thank uh, both Dr. Herzig and Sarah Beth for sharing with us today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, now, since we do have a few minutes, if there were additional questions, you are absolutely welcome to add them now. I know many people were adding throughout various resources on learning ASL, um, particularly in a remote setting, as well as the links were shared to the Learner Variability Project that Sarah Beth was um, covering. Um, I do see one question here which I believe is for Sarah Beth, is around um, their strategies for determining, are determined for a student, sorry, I'm reading this incorrectly. After strategies are determined for a student on LVP, is there a way to share those strategies with other teachers?
So go ahead and spotlight their back here. All right, so when you get to the strategies page, once you've added that to your workspace, you can then share that with other teachers through the share function. And so if you put in their email, uh, you can share your workspace and they can develop their own. And you can actually contribute to each other. So thank you for that great question. And it's around sensitizing instructors to the importance of accessibility around digital learning for deaf and visually impaired students. Um, would one of our presenters prefer to cover that one? All right, well, this is Dr. Jose. Really, you know, in terms of education, many educators have assumptions about what to do with deaf students. There are so many assumptions out there, especially if students are in a mainstream environment or a class alone with hearing peers. It's very difficult to figure out how to offer instruction to all children. And so again, we really have to educate our colleagues to share links, for example, things like we're present, presented today, and to remind them that it's not just because if a student has uh, listening technology or interpreters, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's giving them enough accessibility. And also the National Deaf Center in DC does offer a description and it's some information about how to turn your class um, into a universally designed classroom for instruction that not only benefits the deaf student, but all students. It provides notes, clear visuals, reduces distraction, especially presenting less information on a page. Again, and this doesn't only provide support for the deaf child, but it can also support all students in the classroom. Students, other students may have learning needs and additional disabilities. So universal design of instruction really accommodates many learners' needs and provides additional support. So I would encourage everybody to use that. Hopefully that helps. I don't know if maybe Melissa also wanted to add in um, to another question that was asked, but someone was asking if there were any tips on delivering content for deaf learners via Blackboard or similar platform? Gabby, could you switch the spotlight to Melissa, please? Yeah. Sure, so some other ways to deliver content. Uh, other than Blackboard, you mean? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. I mean, there are a variety of resources about things like a Google Classroom, which is a place that you can upload video links and then be able to tie those into uh, the, I, the Khan, I think, Learning Academy. Um, I'll make sure to add that to our PowerPoint but you can embed videos right there in the document in Google Classroom. That way, if a person feels like, you know, they're struggling to read or write, they can then look back to those videos for additional support. And so I think Google Classroom is fairly friendly. Blackboard, and again, I don't know if most schools use Blackboard, uh, but that's another learning management system. I'd love to jump in, Gabrielle. I saw one more question about how, which approach is best, narrated text captioning or video only. And I want to share that I personally benefit from multi, multi support. So like if a video has captioning also, I benefit a lot from that. I think especially during this time with distance learning, we value that a lot more, you know, during Zoom meetings, having captioning available, having a backup transcript is also good to have. I also wanted to mention, I saw one question about nurses and, um, and face masks. And 
there is a company called Safe and Clear. I'll put it into the chat um, that I my family has purchased that has a clear um, partition here and it doesn't fog up. I think it's really supportive for communication and people that I've talked to um, that use the uh, that, that use those face masks have said that it's very supportive. So that might be a good alternative for nurses or um, practitioners who have to work up close with students. I also saw another question in the chat, which we actually address in our next slide. So I'll transition here. Um, and it was surrounding how to they participated, how to find the recording of this presentation, um, and general information about the community. And so this here has links to ELA's website. I will also in the chat add the link to ELA's YouTube page where you can find the recording and um, access this via that link there. Um, but we are coming to the end of our time, so I want to say a huge thank you to our presenters and interpreters for joining us, and of course for you all as participants for joining in. It was great to learn, of course, but also just to share the general resources with each other. Um, and so hopefully you'll be able to reach out to the presenters um, and connect, uh, but with that we are done for today and we look forward to having you join us at a future presentation. Thank you everyone.